Right. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Couch Warrior Podcast. As always, I'm your host, Mike, and today I am joined by the man on fire himself, James Lucrative MMA. I believe it was last weekend or two weekends ago that you broke 100K again, right? Yes, bro. UFC Mexico was the last time we did it. And it's going to happen again. I think we're going to go for 200K this week, but we'll see, man. Okay, okay. Got to set the sights higher. How you feeling, brother? Thanks for coming on. How you feeling about this card? Yeah, thanks for having me on, bro. We haven't done this in some time, so uh, I'm appreciative that you let me on. It's going to be a good show, bro. Like, this is a massive, massive card. You know, last week was horrible. I went down 2.9 units last week, kind of forced a few bets, if, if I look back on it, probably. And I don't have to do that this week. You know, I got a lot of hot takes. I mean, I guess they're hot. I don't know. We'll see, I guess, if you disagree with me. But I got a lot of solid takes, takes that I believe in. And it just so happens that every pay-per-view this year i've done really well and i don't think this weekend's going to be any different i'm very confident in my picks man so yeah it's a good week for me to be on so hopefully we can um line up on a few things and make money together love it brother yeah last week was weird for me i ended up pretty much breaking even plus 0.1 unit so <laughs> broke even started off super hot and hit duncan round two hit uh yoick and then it all went downhill umar not getting the finish makai have no finish Wait three units on Shamil Gazia for some damn reason. So some more lessons learned. Hoping for a better weekend this one. Let's run through all the comments real quick. The people in the chat, thank you all for tuning in. Daz, as always, appreciate you. Kiwi in the chat, what's up, Kiwi? I know who this is. <laughs> Definitely not their first time here. Dixon, I'm not going to say the full name. What's up, brother? Thank you for tuning in. I always almost slip up. Andrew, I put up the wrong comment. What's up, brother? And let's hop. And my guy, Tyler, let's go. If you guys aren't following my co-host, you better be following him. We're going live on Thursday, <laughs> Thursday, 9.15 p.m. Eastern time. So make sure you're there for that, for our uh, pay-per-view panel. Now let's hop right into the card because we got 14 fights to talk about. First up, we've got Joanne Wood versus Marina Moroz. Wood, 16, 8, and 0. Oh, she's 38 years old at this point. Five foot six with a 65-inch reach. Moroz, 11, 5, and 0. Oh, she's six years younger. Going to be one inch taller and have a, let's call it a two-inch reach advantage. Why don't you start us off, James? Yeah, this isn't a fight that I really want to participate in too much. I do believe that Moroz is going to get the win. I don't really like her at the odds. I think this is Joanne Wood's retirement fight. And, you know, we know what happened to the two retiring fighters last time out. Jamie Pickett fought very badly, fought like he was a retiring fighter. Tyson Pedro fought badly, fought like he was a retiring fighter. And it's not just recency bias. We know time and time again, when these fighters are retiring, they don't perform to the best of their ability, right? Most of the time, retiring, the retiring fighters don't perform to the best of their ability. So I don't expect Joanne Wood to come out here and have a great performance. She's been on a downhill for a long time anyway, and now she's retiring. I don't think she's outright confirmed she's retiring, but she's basically confirmed it. On our Instagram page earlier this year, she, she said that last one, best one. And if you actually look at her Instagram, all her hashtags are hashtag last one, best one. So she's basically saying that her last fight is this fight, and it's going to be her best fight. But they all say that, right? So... I don't think it's going to be any different from most retiring fighters. She's probably going to put on a poor performance here. Stylistically, it's not a minus 250 fight for Marina Moroz. You know, she's got the grappling upside here, but on the feet, it's going to be close. Marina doesn't always do takedowns that well. She doesn't always go to the takedowns. When she does, she's not a great wrestler, in my opinion. But I do think she probably will get a couple of takedowns here. I do think that she's going to win. A, a, I think she's going to win the fight. <clears throat> Since JoJo's retiring, she's been subbed a couple of times. By good girls, but she has been finished on the ground a few times. And Marina Moroz, you know, she's got a couple of finishes on the ground. I wouldn't be massively surprised if she does get a finish. She finished her once before, right? So I don't really see... 
I, I don't I don't think she can't do it again. You know, I, I, if anything, I'd be looking at Marina Moroz by submission. I haven't actually looked at the price too much of that, but yeah, I'll pick kind Marina Moroz. Is it not good price now? Yeah, I mean, you can get a pretty much the same price on fight ends inside the distance because her sub is plus wow. 275 and fight ends is two, plus 215. Yeah, that that yeah, that's crazy. Yeah, in in that in that fight, I'd definitely go for the um, ends inside the distance. You know, we never know if it can come from a ground and pound. She will throw some ground and pound. And on top of that, if Joanne's going to quit, if it's her retirement fight, she might just quit from ground and pound. So, yeah, maybe I look at the ends inside the distance or something, playing on the retirement thing and playing on the fact that Moreau's will be aggressive. She will shoot takedowns in this fight. So a sub could materialize. But, yeah, I, I don't know. I don't have much interest paying Moreau's at the moment. Yeah, yeah. I'm not dying to play the price either. I'm going to be looking at round props possibly, maybe like two, three for Murrows once she wears on on Wood. I've backed Wood quite a bit as he, as a dog before. She, I think yeah. she's a pretty solid striker. She's got okay takedown defense. Not great on the ground. You know, she was Alexa Grasso's first ever submission. I think she was Tyler Santos' second or third. It's not like it takes a whole ton to submit her. Murrows did submit her. I Granted, this is in 2015, so 10 years ago. But, I mean, 10 years ago, Joanne Wood was 28. Now she's 38. So is it impossible that she does it again? I don't think it's impossible. We'll see how likely it is. Not really a fight I'm crazy about. I think on the feet, it's pretty close. Moroz, I think, has the better boxing. At range, Wood is pretty solid. I like the one-twos, but she's a bit basic. I feel like Moroz should be able to handle her here. and Not really a point in spending too much time on that one. So something I do want to mention about this fight, and I'd, I'd tell you this if we was off air as well, just because you mentioned the round props. The only thing about the round props is that Joanne Wood has been submitted five times or finished five times in professional MMA, and every single one of them has come in round one. So we see time and time again, and this is something that everybody watching MMA and betting on MMA can extrapolate to their own cap in, in the future fights. We see oftentimes that trends continue. You know, like fighters that get finished in round three. They seem to always get finished in round three. Fighters, they get run through in round one. They seem to always get run through in round one. So although, like, in my head, it makes sense that, you know, Joanne Wood, she'll start well and she's a retirement fighter. So after a couple of rounds, she might break. But, you know, history tells us that she's been ran through in the first round five separate times. So you might burn yourself on that if you two take the round two and three props. I just want to put that out there. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I, I do play round props relatively small when I do. Don't often play it for more than like a quarter unit unless I'm like super confident. But yeah, we'll see. I'm not dying to have money on that fight. I could live. I think there's better fights to bet on in this card. Yeah. Moving on though, we've got CJ Vergara versus Asu Amabaya. Vergara 12, 4, and 1. He's 32, 5 foot 6 with a 68 inch reach. Amabaya 18, 2, and 0. He's two years younger, two inches shorter, and he's going to have a three inch reach disadvantage. I'll start us off here. I think Amabayev is pretty good. I think he should win this fight. I did play him really early when he was like minus 230. was able to get a decent chunk down. And I kind of did it knowing full well that I'll be able to arb out and hopefully get it, you know, maybe a free play. And it's looking like I will be able to get a free play. I got 4.6 units down on him when he was minus 230. Now I'm getting Vergara at around plus 425. I think the parlay boys are going to come in hot in the next couple of days. And I think I'll be able to put down a unit, make it a free play, and I don't have to sweat at all. I think Almabayev has a pretty significant grappling edge. I really like his wrestling. I do think it's going to be solid here. I do think he can take Vergara down. Vergara does have pretty good scrambling ability. His jujitsu, his submission defense is pretty solid. His BJJ is pretty solid. He's got really good output on the feet. I actually think he is the better striker here. I don't love Almabayev striking. I think he wings kind of too much. Not really too much output on the feet either. Not really throwing together a ton of combinations. So if we're on the feet for some reason, I do think Vergara will be able to land a lot. I do think he'll be able to win the minutes on the feet. But I kind of think that Almabai is just going to get those takedowns, wear on him. And I think he's going to submit him in the second round. But I'm not going to get funky with it. I have a chance to make a free play, so I'm probably going to do it. What are you thinking here, James? Yeah, kind of similar. To be honest, I do want to watch a little bit more of these guys' fights. Uh, there's many fights this week I've taped for couple of fights on PFL, all of the fights on UFC. So I do want to go back and look a little bit more into uh, Asu's tape specifically, not so much CJ Vergara. I want to see his regional tape, but I expect him to have a better show than he did against Ode Osborne. You know, that was his UFC debut. 
it's very rare when someone has a very good UFC debut and then goes down in their next performances. It's usually the other way around. So I do expect him to perform better here than he did in that fight. And he performed well in that fight, you know. He got the finish there on Ode Osborne. And CJ Vergara is a tough fighter, gritty fighter. He can be submitted. We've seen that again. He's very hittable on the feet as well. I wouldn't be surprised if uh, Almabayev cracks him on the feet. You know, it kind of reminds me of how everyone thought um, Charles Johnson would be grappled by the last duty fought. I can't remember his name. It kind of reminds me of Albayev, actually. I got them mixed up. Was that Charles Johnson's last fight? What was the name? Uh, 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 is it Asmat? Yeah, I think it was. I can't now, remember his full now name. Now I'm also blanking. Yeah, it's, it's, it's similar to this dude. Like, it reminds me of this guy. I don't know why. Just they, they fight kind of similar as well. But, you know, you always do you get this as well, where you get fighters and you just get them mixed up all the time? It's like two fighters and you just get it mixed up. For me, Bill Algio and Julian yeah. Arosa. Okay, I mix Bill Algio. I used to mix Bill Algio with Billy Quarantillo. <laughs> okay, that's another good yeah. one. Yeah, so anyway, I, I think that it could be a fact where... You remember Charles Johnson got dropped in that fight in the first round? No mm -hmm. one really expected him to have striking success. I can actually see Asu hurting CJ yeah. Vergara on the feet here because Vergara is super hittable, man. He's, he's yeah. very open. And I believe that the public sentiment is very heavily on Almabayev's wrestling. And they might be underrating his striking a little bit. I don't think he's a great striker. I think 15-minute striking fight is not good. But I do think he, his timing is quite good. And I do think he can catch CJ coming in. So I just wanted to put that out there because I feel like that might materialize in a fight. Overall, though, I do think that Albayev is going to be able to get the takedowns. Um, Almabayev, you know, I don't really... I mean, CJ is very gritty and scrappy. But I think that once he's grounded, you can kind of do some damage, do some work on him. But like I said, I want to take the fight a little bit more. I'm not fully confident in my read, but I'll pick Almabayev to win the fight here. I don't know if he's... I think he'll probably finish him. I think he probably gets a finish on the mat. Yeah, there's there's not too many ways to play Almabayev at this point. I mean, ITD is minus 105. You could just play the under at that point. Under two and a half is pick him. Yeah. What's it? His I, KO I, I, is actually pretty interesting. Plus 615. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think he'll hurt him, but... To actually finish with the KO, it's a little bit tougher. But that, to be honest, that's that's wide, man. Six to Ground one and is pound. a big price. Yeah, six one is six to one is a big price, bro. Yeah, not a bad spot. But we can move on to the fight everybody's waiting for. We've got Josh Parisian fighting Rebellus Despain, I believe. Do you know how to pronounce his last name? I don't know, bro. <laughs> We're gonna go with Rebellus. So Rebellus is four and zero. He's undefeated. He's thirty five years old. Six foot seven with an 87 inch reach. He is an Olympian in Taekwondo, I believe. Parisian, 15, 7 and 0. He's 34. He's one year younger, three inches shorter. And he's going to have an eight inch reach disadvantage. Why don't you start us off, James? I ain't got much to say about this one, bro. I, I ain't in the business of backing Josh Parisian with my hard earned money. I'm pretty sure I did it against Chase Sherman. And then he got beat. And that was very embarrassing. So. I ain't going to be doing it again. I think this dude is being set up by the UFC for an early knockout. I mean, I don't think it. We all know it, right? They're giving him one of the worst heavyweights on the roster. But why wouldn't they? It's his UFC debut. But it seems tailor-made for this dude to come in and get some crazy head kick or some weird athletic finish. So I think that's what's going to happen, bro. I think it's going to be a KO one to um, Rebellis. Yeah, yeah. I don't have a ton to add here. I mean... We all know what they're doing here. They're bringing in the 4-0 guy, Taekwondo Olympian. He's 35, so you have to fast track him if you want to take advantage of of him and his skills. I don't I don't know who they're going to give him next. Like is he's a guy who you got to be careful with like as a UFC matchmaking for him cuz what's his ground game look like? Probably we have no we have no clue at all. Is Parisian going to be the one to take him down and dominate him on the mat? Probably not. Probably not. If his cardio ends up being horrible, maybe. I, I've got no interest. Rebellus round one is like minus 200. Round one knockout is like very similar. Not really a lot of ways to play it. Of course, the D-Gen in me wants to play Parisian round two and three. But <laughs> honestly, the books are on it so far. I was pretty surprised that they gave the price they did. I think Parisian round two is plus 16. Round three is plus 2,000. Okay, it's climbing. But I kind of expected more than that. And we'll, we'll see. Maybe FanDuel will give me plus 3,000, and I might have to do it for a little sprinkle. But I, I think the most likely outcome is he dies within the first minute or two. I mean, Rebellus has four pro fights, and I think if all four combined have gone, what, like 30 seconds, something like that, even less, I yeah. think. Yeah. Yeah, it's absurd, and he's probably going to get the knockout here, so he can move on. 
Next up, we've got a fight I didn't even know was on the card until a few days ago. Felipe Linz versus Ion Kutalaba. Lin 17, 5 and 0. Oh, he's 38, 6 foot 2 with a 78 inch reach. Kute Laba, 17, 9 and 1. He's 38 years younger, going to be one inch shorter, and he's going to have a three inch reach disadvantage. I'll start us off here. I had Kute Laba when this match was first booked months ago, but he was like plus money when I got him. Now he's a slight favorite, minus 130. I do think Kute Laba is going to kill him in the first round. I like Kute Laba's power. I like his grappling. I like his aggressiveness. Cardio is a little concerning, but I think he's a solid striker. And Felipe Lins is he's fine. He's fine. I think people get a little bit overexcited on him these days, which I don't really understand. He's 38 years old. None of his wins are that impressive. I mean, OSP, Marcin Prakniao, Grishin is probably one of the better wins he has. Before that, he's getting knocked out by Bozer. He's losing to Andre Arlovsky. I don't really see it. I don't, I don't think he's a great dog shot personally. I think Kute Laba finishes him. Can he? Can Kute Laba gas and Felipe Linz take over in the later rounds? Yeah, it's it's possible. We've seen it. We've seen the draw with Kute Laba and uh, Jacoby, but I think someone like Jacoby is a much better striker, much better at maintaining his range, keeping Kute Laba away, and I don't think that Felipe Linz is all that great at any of that. I think he backs up quite a bit, and I think Kute Laba is going to get him out in the first or second round. What do you think, James? Yeah, I have to echo what you said, man. I kind of agree with your breakdown. Um, I feel like a lot of people will be trying to fade Kutalaba this week. I've seen it over Twitter a little bit already. Yep. And I believe that that's because the narrative is you don't want to back a round one fighter, right? Well, everyone's going to bet against him and then our round one fighter is going to win him round one. Why is he a round one fighter? Because he wins him round one all the time. Because so of the Dustin he... Jacoby fight, that's why. Yeah, but the reason they're saying that is because he wins in round one a lot. He's got loads of round one finishes. But that's not a bad thing. Yeah, of course, if the fight goes three rounds, it's a bad thing. But he can blow motherfuckers out of the water early. And Linz is there to be blown out of the water, in my opinion. I don't really think Linz is a great fighter. I think he's a little bit better these days. You know, he's shown some process in his game. He's shown some grappling, which he did very well. I, I wasn't expecting him to do that to Grishin. To be honest, Grishin is a big, strong guy. But Grishin's old motherfucker himself. I think he's older than Linz. So it's like, I don't, I don't know, man. Um, I do think Kutalaba has a good chance to knock him out very early, to be honest. I'll pick him for the win. Yep, I'm with you there. And we can move on. Next up, we've got another really fun fight. I mean, I'll be saying that all night long. We've got Michelle Pereira versus Mikhail Olaseshik. I've been losing my mind with these two, their first names. Talking yeah, to people, yeah. Mikhail, Michelle, it's such a mess, but Pereira, 29, 11, and 0, 30 years old. He's six foot one at the 73-inch reach. This is his second fight at middleweight. Michal, he's 19, 6, and 0, 29. He's one year younger, one inch shorter, and he's going to have a one-inch reach advantage. And I believe this is his second fight at middleweight, or third. So why don't you start us off, James? This is a fucking banger, bro. I can't wait for this fight. On the one hand, I feel like Pereira is going to get found out badly one day. You know, I don't know. There's just something weird about him. I don't think he has much from his back. I think when he gets taken down, he doesn't have much. I still don't believe in his gas tank for three rounds in a high-paced, heavy, heavy fight. I don't really believe in it too much. You know, he's dropping rounds to Andre Filo, getting hurt there. Could have been finished on another day. I feel like Oleg Zaychek is going to pose a lot of problems for him in the fact that he's going to push forward and pressure box like Phil Howe did. And Fiaho had a lot of success in that fight. And, you know, now we know that Andre is not actually UFC level. So that wasn't the best look from Pereira, even though he did win the fight. Um, but on the other hand, Oleg Zaychik is so, so easily hit. He's so hittable, man. I think Pereira is going to be able to land some heavy shots. Pereira is very explosive, very athletic. He lands hard every time he fights. I don't think I've seen a fight where he hasn't landed heavy lever on his opponent. I have not seen it. Apart from the Phil... Um, Connolly the, fight. Yeah, Connolly was just landing heavy lever at the air. And then the Dusko Todorovic fight, when he just got knocked out in round one, that was a very, very strange knockout. Um, but outside of that, every single fight I've seen, he lands heavy shots. And I don't know if Oleg Zajic going to be able to take it, man. I mean, obviously, he took it in his last fight. That was a crazy war. I actually bet on both of these guys in their last fight. I bet on Michel... Um, Who's Michael? Michael? Mikhail? Mikhail? I, I think Mikhail is Michael, yeah. yeah so Mikhail. So I bet on Mikhail in his last fight against... 
Chidi. That big motherfucker. Yeah, Chidi and Jaquano. And that was a war, bro. Like, I bet on him at Pickham or something. I thought he was dead. And then he came back in the second half and finished him. That was an epic fight. I also bet on Pereira in his last fight, at like minus 170, minus 180 against um, that. Petrosky. Uh, yeah, Petrosky. I'm forgetting all of these names today, man. I don't know what I it is, bro. You, bro. I've been in the game for too long, man. I'm forgetting them all. You're on the ball. Um, yeah, so I bet on both of them. So I do actually like both of their styles in terms of, I guess, the matchups they've had. But the way I see this fight going is Michelle Lan Pereira lands a lot of shots early. I think he's going to... I think he can also get blown out of the water early because Oleg Zaychik will start very, very fast. I'm not saying it's impossible, but I feel like the, the timing is going to be there all day for Pereira early. I think he's going to la land spinning back kicks. I think he's going to land spinning wheel kicks to the head, um, mainly spinning back kicks to the body, to be honest. And he, he jumps in with flying knees. Michelle just crashes distance. So I could definitely see a flying knee and a weird one where like the flying knee hits the chest or something because he's just crashing distance. You know, I, I can see something like that um, materializing. So I'm not going to make a bet on this fight. I think it's very, very volatile. I think we could see a Chidi and Jokwani fight again where both fighters are, like, it, it is minus 110. Um, I'm going to pick Pereira. I think that he'll be able to stay on the outside. I think he's got much better footwork. And I also think he has a similar amount of finishing upside. Probably not as much because Oleg Zaychek is just a tank and he's got a lot more finishes in the UFC. Pereira doesn't have many finishes in the UFC at all. I think we have to go back to the Danny Roberts fight. Um, so, yeah, I'm, but oh, I mean, outside of his last fight, I think we have to go back to the Danny Roberts fight. But I'm going to go with Pereira overall. I think he's, yeah, I think he's got a better... Better style to win the fight, but I'm not confident. Probably one of my least confident picks on the entire card, and I can see the fight going either way. Yeah, yeah. I've seen some conf very confident takes on both sides, and I don't know how you could be super confident here. Pereira, like, I, I will say he's come a long way from the Tristan Connolly fight where he literally gassed himself coming into the octagon because he was dancing, yeah. flipping, doing those weird leg kicks where he, like, goes behind the leg with the other one. But I think he, he he stopped that for the most part. His output yeah. has increased. Like in the uh, Santiago Ponzinibbio fight in round three, he landed the most significant strikes for himself in the fight. So clearly the cardio has gotten better. He's much cleaner. He's still doing his funky stuff. He's still jumping for knees, but he's doing a lot less, which is something you want to see if you're backing the guy. I think him coming up to middleweight is also pretty good. He's still huge. I mean, compared to Petrosky, who's not a small guy, he looked massive. And I think the power clearly translated as well. I mean, he knocked out Petrosky and I think it was about a minute. But I think Michal is, he's kind of problematic for a guy like Pereira. Michal, a lot of pressure. I agree he's really hittable. That's why I'm always confused when I pull up UFC stats and it's like 60% striking defense for the guy. And I'm just like, how? Because he gets hit by literally everything. I guess his head movement is okay, but I really don't understand how it's that high. I do think Pereira is going to land a lot, but Alasashik, he's going to be backing him up. And something I noticed with Pereira is I don't think he's very good off the back foot. I think he struggles a little bit more there. Fialio had had uh, success doing that, backing him up. Uh, Ponzinibbio had success doing that, back him up, backing him up. And Michal, he has experience with big guys. I mean, he was at 205 for how long? He's fought really, really big guys. Even Chitty at 185 is massive as well. He took a lot of shots. He's very durable. He's been knocked out once, and that was in, like, 2015. So I can see him getting knocked out here, but I don't think it's a super likely outcome. And who would I trust more knowing it's a three-rounder? I mean, knowing that we might go the full 15, I trust Michal because he, he's got the cardio. He's going to keep coming forward. He lands a lot of body shots, which I think is something he needs to do here. Go to the body, go to the body, go to the body, really tire out Mich uh, Pereira. And then get that late finish, win the decision, whatever it ends up being. I'm going to side with the underdog here. Whether I get to a bet, I'm not sure yet because I am a little bit concerned. I think he is very hittable. And Pereira does hit real hard. And he's super explosive and athletic. So it, it's it's a tough fight to call. But I'm going to lean with the underdog here. Bro, to be honest, I didn't know he was the underdog, you know. I yeah, don't he's know like why. plus 130. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I mean... Now my breakdown changes a little bit. You know, my breakdown's exactly the same. But now I want... It's funny because we're gamblers. So now I want to say, no, I'm picking Olizacek just because he's the underdog. But 
Yeah, I'll, I guess I'll stick with Pereira, but I think this fight should be minus 110. You can kind of tell by my breakdown that I think the fight should be minus 110. So plus 130, now you're starting to get to the, the range where I'm going to have to start looking a little bit. If we hit plus 140, I'm going to have to play it. I'm going to have to play it. So at plus 130, I don't know, you might even... I don't want to bet this, but it's all about numbers at the end of the day. And I'm pretty confident this is fairly 50-50, bro. Yeah, and I think we're going to get a better price. I really do think big pay-per-views like this, I already know on around Thursday, I start getting texts from my boys, yo, who are we parlaying? Yeah, and yeah. I'm always saying nobody. <laughs> but yeah. once you start getting those text messages, once you start hearing that, then the line might be a little bit better. And I, I do think that's going to happen with a pay-per-view like this. It's a huge pay-per-view. A lot of yeah. more casual fans coming in. And I, I think we're going to get it. I, I kind of think we're going to get like plus 150. At least that's what yeah. I'm hoping for. Fingers Hopefully, crossed. Yeah. That's, a, that's an auto bet, to be honest. Yeah, it, with, with this with this matchup, I, I think that's a great bet. I'm not there yet, but we'll see. Yeah. Moving on, though, we've got Pedro Munoz versus Kyler Phillips. Munoz, he's going to be 28 and 0. He's 37 years old. Five foot six with a 65 inch reach. Phillips, 11, 2 and 0. He's 28. He's going to be nine years younger, two inches taller. And he's going to have a seven inch reach advantage. I'll start us off here. I think Kyler is going to win the fight. I'm a big fan of the guy. I think he's real, real solid. I understand he has that loss to Paiva, but he fought like an absolute dumbass in that first round. Just let it all rip, almost got the finish, and then gassed himself out and lost that fight. The issue I have here is Pedro's not really the kind of guy you want to be fading at, like minus 240, minus 220. He might be up there in, in age. He's 37 years old, but I still think he's good. I backed him against Gutierrez at a pretty good dog number. I think it was like plus 200 or something as yeah. well. And, he, he, you know, he still got it. I don't really see how Kyler could be such a heavy favorite here. Is he going to take down Munoz, dominate him on the ground? I don't think so. He might get takedowns. He might take his back. But I don't think it's going to be super dominant on the ground. Pedro's pretty good defensively. And in the striking, you know, Phillips has more weapons. He's more, like, I don't want to say dynamic, but he just has more tools on the feet, mixes it up more. Pedro's primarily, you know, he's kickboxing, hitting those leg kicks, going up upstairs. So I think Phillips should win the fight, but I think the line is pretty damn wide for, for, for this fight. And especially with Phillips, you know, his cardio has definitely gotten better. His IQ seems to have gotten better. I thought he looked pretty solid in the Barcelos fight. Thought that was a pretty damn good win for him. But Barcelos is fading, as we saw in the Quinones fight. I was pretty surprised by that one was on Barcelos heavy and I was sweating pretty hard until that finish. And if Kyler comes out here and fights like a dummy again, lets it all rip in the first round, I wouldn't be shocked at all if Pedro took over. So I'm going to pick Kyler, but I think the line is pretty wide. So I don't know if I'll be doing anything here. How about you, James? Yeah, I don't understand why the line's this wide, to be honest, mate. Um, I was also on Gutier I was also on Pedro against Gutierrez, the exact same price it is now. I thought the books would have learned, you know, this is a step up in competition for Kyler Phillips, most certainly. Probably the best fighter he's ever fought, bro. Um, maybe, you know, again, Munoz or Song, basically level in terms of the best fighter he's fought. So why is he a big, big favorite in this spot? I don't really understand it. I think he's probably win round one, but I think he'd definitely lose round three. So I guess it really comes down to round two. And... I kind of like to take the guy who I think will win round three and round two as well. Because if I'm saying it's because of cardio, which it is, Kyler Phillips always gasses out in round three. Well, then maybe the gas comes two minutes earlier. Do you know what I mean? And then we get the end of the round bias in round two as well. It doesn't always play out like that because it depends on how much they gas and stuff like that. But yeah, I'm, I'm happy to take a shot on Munoz here. I don't understand the line, you know. A lot of times when I take bets on underdogs, I understand the line. Like when I bet on Brandon Moreno, uh, sorry, Brandon Roy Val a couple of weeks ago. I understood why the line was where it was, right? I understood that people are seeing the grappling upside. I was looking at the fight a little bit differently, which I've posted about. And so that's why we got the number. But I understood it. I don't understand this line. So then I'm thinking like, I understand when I look at lines, I understand mostly where the market is, right? So now I'm thinking to myself, is there something I don't know? Why is the line like this? But I don't want to second guess myself. I see a line that's wide. I believe it's wide. I'm going to play it. I mean, it's going to be fairly tit for tat. No one's going to land massive shots. Kyler might land a spinning wheel kick to the head or something in round one. But I mean, outside of that, it's going to be fairly, fairly close in terms of volume. 
I think Munoz is very good at suppressing volume as well. Everyone he fights, no one tees off on him. So I don't know, man. He won the first round against O'Malley not long ago. And, you know, O'Malley is similar to Kyler Phillips. They train together. They're very similar in their styles with their footworks. Yeah. They even look the same. So I don't know, man. I could see Munoz winning this fight 29-28, uh, 30-27 even. He could even 30-27 Kyler Phillips. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm actually, I don't think I'm going crazy by saying that because I think that he could suppress Kyler Phillips' craziness round one. And I don't think Phillips is going to have grappling success like he did against Hayoni Barcelos and like he does against every single person he fights. You know, we have to remember that Kyler Phillips, he's very dynamic on the feet, but he wins a lot of fights by getting his grappling going. He, get, he mixes takedowns in. I don't really think he's going to be able to do that against Pedro Munoz, you know? So, yeah, I'll take a shot on Pedro Munoz here. Plus 200 is a good price. Yeah, yeah. Can't blame you on the dog shot. I don't know if I'll get there. Might be a little bit of a fan bias. I do like him a lot, Kyler, as a fighter. So we'll see, but I, I do think the wine, line is wide as well. Moving on, though. It's pretty crazy this fight is on the prelims, and it's under a Macy Barber fight. But we got Mateusz Gamrot and Art versus RDA. Gamrot 23, 2 and 0. He's 33 years old, 5 foot 10 at the 70 inch reach. RDA 20, 32, 15 and 0. Going to be six years older at 39, two inches shorter, same reach. Sarasov James. This is a weird fight. Um, I might actually look at a little bit more tape on this one. You know, it's still fairly early in the week. So the way I do my tape study, I guess it kind of just depends year to year, month to month. You know, sometimes I like to do it all in one day, sometimes I don't. But over the last six to nine months, I've kind of been doing tape study sporadically. Early in the week, uh, the week before, I get like the, the fights that I think I'm going to have bets on. I do a lot of tape on that and I kind of get that locked in in my head. And then I see where the lines go. And then the fights that I'm not too sure about that I want to leave to the back, I kind of just watch a little bit of those over the week. So I'll watch a couple of fights one day, a couple of fights the next day. I just feel a little bit better doing it that way. And oftentimes, I don't have a strong read. So when I don't have a strong read, I just stop taping it. I'm like, I don't have a strong read right now. Maybe tomorrow I will, because it really depends on where mentally where you are on the certain things you can see in fights. And you can attest to this. You know, sometimes you're just having a, a, a mental block in your head and you can't really see any value on anything. Then mm -hmm. another day, you're like, oh, you're really reading the fights very well, you know. So if you spread it out over days, it enables you to, I guess, ride the wave of variance in your head when you've got that mental clarity, right? So I do want to look at a little bit more tape on these guys. I don't think that Gamera should be a massive favorite as he is right now, though. But on the other hand, RDA is old as fuck. He's always had issues with grapplers. Now he's at well away, even bigger grapplers. Gamera is a beast grappler. Like I don't like this for RDA, but there's just something telling me that Gamera's not going to be able to hold him down. And I guess that's because Gamera doesn't hold anyone down. So I guess that's what's telling me it. And then also... RDA is a veteran in this sport. Would I be super surprised if RDA reversed something and got on top for a bit and, you know, won around that way? I mean, I wouldn't be massively surprised. Would I be surprised if he's kind of outpointing them on the feet like everyone does against Gamrot for the most part? I wouldn't be massively surprised. I just, I guess I'm really put off by Gamrot minus 450 or wherever he is. It's not really on the stylistic matchup because I do think Gamrot will be able to get his single leg going eventually. I do think Gamrot will be able to get control time. I do think on I do think he'll be able to hold him up against the cage. I do think he can make the fight boring and win the fight in those boring clinch positions because he's stronger. So yeah, I'm gonna pick Gamrot for the win, man, but I don't know. There's something weird about this fight. I don't know what it is, but maybe it's just a gut feeling. And oftentimes in this sport, you have to ignore your gut feeling. Sometimes you have to not ignore it, but sometimes you have to ignore it because it's just complete bullshit. So I don't know, man. I guess I think Gamrot's gonna win a decision. I'd be looking at the overs in this spot. I don't know what the odds are. I'm looking right now, but I guess they're going to be juiced. I don't think he's going to finish RDA. He doesn't have much finishing upside. So it goes the distance is minus 275. It's not nice. Gamrot by points, minus 145. The books are onto it, man. I think I'll probably just pass on this fight, but I will do a little bit more tape. Yeah, yeah, I'm on Gamrot. I did play him early. Another line I played early, him and Asu were the ones I did. This is like over a month ago, I think I got it on DraftKings. Minus 238. Played that to win one unit. Nothing too insane. I do think it's kind of a tough matchup, so I don't really understand this line whatsoever. Minus 455 is pretty bananas. And if I was betting now, I'd probably have some interest in RDA because he is probably the better... Not probably. I, I think he's the better striker for sure. I think he's got more power on the feet. And he's got really good jujitsu. But 
I do think he's going to get out grappled. I think Gamrot's going to get the takedowns. I know it, it was at 170, but I did not expect Vicente Luque to get eight takedowns on him. I didn't expect Vicente Luque to even get a takedown on him. So that was pretty surprising. I do feel like there seems to be a bit of a decline here. He is 38 years old after all. The dude's had a very long career. And Gamrot, for the most part, is still on the up and up. And I, I just think that he's going to get it done. I think he's going to keep shooting no matter what. Maybe RDA can catch him with something. But if he doesn't, I, I do think Gamrot takes over. Even if he if he wasn't winning from the first minute. So I think it's a Gamrot spot, but I wouldn't condone playing minus 450 on him. Moving on, though, we've got Caitlin Sermonera now versus Macy Barber. I'm going to just keep calling her Shukagian because it's much easier for me. Shukagian, 18, 5 and 0. She's 35 years old, 5 foot 9 at the 68 inch reach. Barber, 13, 2 and 0. She's going to be 25. She's 10 years younger, four inches shorter. And she's going to have a three-inch reach disadvantage. So I'll start us off here. Going into this one, <clears throat> excuse me, I honestly felt like pre-tape, pre-anything, I was looking at Barber and I was like, all right, maybe this is like a Barber decision or like a Barber round three decision spot. And then I ran the tape and I kind of remembered why I always back Shukagan. She's like almost always an underdog, similar to like Bilal Muhammad, right? Almost always an underdog, almost always a wide line. And then almost always pulls it off as the underdog. And I made a lot of money back in Shukagian. And I was watching this fight. And I was like, I really might have to do it again. Well, not dying to. She's 35. Barber is improving. She's 25 years old. She's getting better and better and better. Doing less stupid things. Her striking isn't as loopy anymore. There was a point where she was just throwing wild bombs. Now you see a little bit straighter punches. A little bit cleaner. I still think she's a bit wild on the feet though. I don't love her output on the feet as well. And do I think she's going to come out here and out grapple Shukagian? Not really. I don't think she's going to get a lot of takedowns. If she does, I don't expect her to hold down Shukagian very long. And I just trust Shukagian more on the feet. I think she's in the, the cleaner striker. One, twos down the pipe. Good kicks to the body. She goes to the body pretty often, which I like a lot. Slow Macy Barber down because she's going to be very active in the first round. She's going to be a lot in the first. But if you slow her down, start to take that power away from her. I, I can definitely see Shukagian taking it. And at this price, I mean, she's like plus 170, plus 180. I almost feel like I have to. I haven't done it yet. I don't know if I will. But again, this is another spot where I'm going to wait. Going to let the parlay guys do their thing. Parlay Barber up. I already know a bunch of people talking about it. And then we'll see. Maybe I'll take a small shot on Shukagian. Would I be shocked if Barber just did enough damage to win maybe round one and two and take it away? I wouldn't be shocked. Would I be shocked if she knocked out Shukagian? I'd be surprised, not shocked, but I'd be pretty surprised. I don't think she's going to knock her out like she did Reboss. So I, I, it's a close fight for me. I don't think anyone should be this wide of a favorite. So I'm leaning on the dog shot here. How about you, James? Do you remember back in the day when everyone was talking about Macy Barber becoming the next big thing in MMA? The, yep, the new champion. Long ago. No, I know. How times have changed, right? We're talking about her going 50-50 fight with Andrea Lee, the corpse of Andrea Lee. Dana White used to say, um, oh, this girl's amazing, you know, she could be the next big thing when she the was The future, like her nickname. Yeah, the future. The future's turned out all right for her, I guess. She got a nice win in her last fight, but she's the king of getting these decisions or the queen of getting these decisions that potentially shouldn't go her way. You know, the Maverick fight wasn't a great look takedowns came there andrea lee fight wasn't a great look she got taken down there she's been taken down many times in her career roxanne metaferi took her down a couple of times rebas took her down as well and i don't know man Ch caitlin doesn't really shoot takedowns so it's not a great look i think macy bob is going to win the fight i think it's going to be like a minus ev win i think it's going to be one of those ones where Maybe Caitlin looks really good early and then she kind of just fades. Macy kind of puts on a great performance in round three like she does against anyone. It's crazy because Macy in round three, she 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 beat the fuck out of, I mean, not beat the fuck, but she did. She beat up Alexa Grasso and Alexa went on to be champion. Very, very good fighter. So we know Macy, Macy has flashes of brilliance. She knocked out Amanda Rebas. You don't have to be that brilliant to do that, though. You just need to... <laughs> you just need to have a somewhat of decent power, you know, for for the weight class, which she does. We know that she has power, yeah. athletic ability, tenacity. You know, I like these type of things in fighters, but 
man, like this is going to be 29-28 or something, bro. Like this ain't going to be... Maybe she fucks her up in round three or something, but like... I'm going to say for like 70% of this fight, it's going to be fairly 50-50. But the chick's changed her name. So that means she's got married. You know, when girls get married, mate, like, I don't think they're full, I don't think she's fully in on this fighting thing anymore. She She's thinking about kids. She's thinking about her husband. You know, like, she's thinking about family life. It's a different level now. So that ain't a good look, in my opinion. We saw what happened to Nina Nunes when her name went Nunes. You know what I mean? And I, 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 like, it sounds like I'm making a joke. I honestly believe that. I mean, it's not even arguable, man. Once you get married, your mind is not fully on the game anymore. Like, you, now she's thinking about kids. She's 35 years of age, man. I don't even know if she has kids, but she's definitely thinking about the future and retirement and, you know, whatever married couples do. I ain't there yet, you know. But I think that's going to be a bad thing for her in this fight because I think the future is still young comparatively. I think she's still looking at the future. I think she still wants to be champion. And I think that could be the difference in this fight. Skill for skill is close to a pick -em. Like, genuinely is. Like, prime for prime, it's close to a pick -em, But I don't know. And I'll, I'll pick Barber to make the, the, the minus EV win. She's two rounds down. She gets a finish in round three. Or it's 1-1 one, one going into round three. And she edges it on athleticism. Something like that. Yeah. I, I can see what you're saying for sure. Honestly, prime for prime, I feel like Shukagian should should be a favorite, but obviously yeah. way past their prime at this point. Real quick, catching up with the chat. James, who do you think would win? Prime Dillashaw or Sean O'Malley? To be honest, bro, I don't really know too much about Prime Dillashaw, you know. Like, I came into the uh, the UFC kind of around, like, 2015 time, 2014 times, and that Dillashaw was, I guess he was kind of prime then, like, just around then, but I wasn't really looking at it. Um, so I don't know. I, I, Sean O'Malley, we'll get on to Sean O'Malley later. He's a very good striker, but I don't, outside of that, I don't really know. D Dillashaw, might, I think Dillashaw would probably win, to be honest. Yeah, yeah, I agree. But he's a little bit small. That might have been a problem, but I think yeah, Prime definitely. Dillashaw probably takes that fight. Uh, Macy Barber power looked improved. I think it's just Rebus and re her defense and her chin that made her look improved. Do I think she's going to do what Andraj did? No. Andraj is different, dude. People don't understand. Andraj is – she's a beast. The woman is a beast, and, and she always has been. And my guy Tyler over here, Barber does have the ability to battle back late. Should be close, but the lasting impression is going to be Barber landing late. That's what the judges will go on. Yeah, fair game. Definitely fair game. But, you know, when you say the fight's close and everyone's saying the fight is close, one of these women is minus 200. The line is not close. So, like you mentioned earlier, it's a numbers game. We'll see what happens. Maybe I'll get there. I don't know just yet, though. But honestly, bro, uh, Ch Chikagan, um decision might be the way to go because you'll be able to get it at a decent price. She ain't going to finish Macy, man. Like, yeah. Macy's a tough, tough, tough girl, bro. I don't think she'll finish her. Chikagan can't finish her lunch. And on top of that, Barber is, like, so fucking durable. When was the last time Chukagan got a finish? Can you tell me, bro? I can't I tell you. Like There's no way I can. You can't even tell me. No, let's I do can't. it. Let, let's do it for the people. Let's have a look. Blonde I think she has like up. three finishes. I'm looking right now. I can't find it. Tapology. Oh, I've never seen a tapology like this. Decision, decision. She got a knee in 2016 in CFFC, the fight that got her into the UFC. She got a knee in 45 seconds. This girl ain't finishing Macy Barber, bro. So if you can get plus 250 on decision. Probably plus 215. Than... Yeah, but that's that's one book. What are you looking on? Bet online, the worst odds yeah. of all time. Yeah, yeah, fuck bet online, man. We'll, we'll, we'll go somewhere yeah. else and we'll get like plus 250 or something like that. Yeah, if it's like plus 250, I, I would obviously like that over the money line. But when we're talking just a little bit of a difference. Yeah, I like 215, I was... but we'll get better than that. We'll get better than yeah. that. I just I always think back to the Bilal Sean Brady fight and I backed Bilal there and I posted my bet and everyone was like, you're such an idiot. Why don't you just bet Bilal by decision? And it was like a 10 cent difference. Like, why would I do that? And then look what happened. Something no one expected. Bilal gets the finish. I cashed my ticket peacefully and it was nice. I think Bilal <laughs> has more finishing upside than Caitlin does. So way more, way more. Yeah, I don't think it's the best comparison, but it's just why I tend to, if it's close, I'll just go with the money line. 
If it's yeah. not, I'll go with the method I think they're going to get it done with. Yeah, always. <clears throat> but moving on, we've got the last prelim, and it's bananas that this is on the prelims. We've got Curtis Blades versus Jonathan Almeida. Blades 17, 4, and 0. Oh, he's 33 years old, 6 foot 4 with an 80 inch reach. Almeida 22 and 0, oh, one year younger, one inch shorter, and gonna have a one inch reach disadvantage. Why don't you start us off, James? Just the main event of the evening, isn't it? One of them. This is, this is a banger, bro. I'm going with Jolton Almeida, bro. I think that Curtis Blades is going to get taken down at some point. I don't trust Curtis Blades on bottom. And I think on the feet, he's open to be hit. And I think Jolton can do something on the feet. What is, what's Curtis Blades' game plan here? Take Jolton down? I think if he takes Jolton down, I think Jolton will eventually reverse it. I think he's got much, much better BJJ. I think it will be like black belt versus white belt, honestly. Um and I think Jolton can reverse the takedown into a submission of his own. And so I don't think Blades is going to do that. Well, Blades probably will do that because it's Curtis Blades. So he's probably going to try and shoot takedowns in this fight, which, again, just leads to a Jolton win. And if he is smart and he doesn't shoot takedowns, well, he's going to sprawl and brawl. He's an OK boxer with a couple of leg kicks. He's nothing special. I don't think he's super dangerous. I don't think he's going to blow Jolton out on the feet. Jolton's very good at just staying away from range and not getting hit. So Jolton will be just staying outside of range, throwing his kick up the middle. That's the only thing he's got. Throwing his kick. And then he's going to shoot and get to the legs, bro. Jolton is one of the most athletic men I've ever seen in my life, let alone at a heavyweight division. We don't have athletes like that in a heavyweight division. We just They just don't exist. So I don't think that Blades has ever seen anything like this before. I, I honestly don't. And yeah, man, I'm picking Jolton Almeida. I think he gets a finish. Yeah, I'm with you there. I like Jolton here. I got him a plus 100, I believe. That's going to be my free bet of the week. Um, I do think he's going to win. I, I like him quite a bit here. Curtis, he hasn't really fought anyone like this. He hasn't really faced many takedown attempts. I know he was talking about this week. He's like, I'm going to use my wrestling defensively, keep it on the feet. And look, if he can keep it on the feet the whole time, I think he's a way better striker than Almeida. Like. He's actually pretty clean. I'm pretty impressed with the stuff he's doing on the feet. I used to think he's a future champion. And obviously, I don't really believe that anymore. But I still think he's a cleaner striker than Almeida. I like his combinations. I like how he mixes it up. Almeida, like you mentioned, he's got two moves on the feet. He's got the kick, the front kick, and he's got uh, he's got the jab. And that's it. it. Really doesn't have anything else. I think in the UFC, he has what? Like less than 30, 40 significant strikes on the feet. I think even less than that. Pretty sure it's a much smaller number. I just didn't want to exaggerate. But he's not landing much on the feet at all because he's taking guys down immediately. But the truth is we wouldn't even get this, this price if not for the Derek Lewis fight. People are looking at that thinking, wow, he couldn't finish Derek Lewis. He's not going to finish Curtis Blades. Look, first of all, does he need a finish to win this fight? No. I think he can win a decision if it goes there. He showed he has cardio. He beat the crap out of Derek Lewis for 25 minutes. He just nonstop. It was domination. It's not like Lewis was ever close to winning that fight. He was never even close. He just survived. And that's kind of what Derek Lewis does a lot of the time. He's like, we joke about it all the time. He's one of the best in terms of jujitsu defense because he just doesn't give a shit. Just stand back up. Why are you struggling? Just stand back up, man. But I don't think Blades is going to be doing that. It's hard because we don't have a ton of info on Blades' takedown defense. We've seen him taken down by Volkov. I think that was like in the fourth or fifth round. That was kind of weird, but I think Blades was exhausted at that point. And then you got to go all the way back to 2016 to Cody East, who took him down like three times and then gassed himself also and lost that fight. But yeah. seeing that, do I really think Blades has improved his takedown defense through that? Probably not. He hasn't really had to. Why would he? He's already a tremendous wrestler. He's been fighting pretty much only strikers. So why would he even worry about the grappling? And he's never had to worry about jujitsu like this. That's for sure. Almeida's jujitsu is top tier. So I do think Almeida's going to get him down. I think he can sub him. I'm pretty tempted on the knockout props in terms of rounds. I mean, we got round one knockout is plus 1,200. We're talking about heavyweights. So that's pretty crazy. And people, I feel like people forget with these props. Oh, the one. It doesn't have to be on the feet. Ground and pound TKOs count. Yeah. Bro, that's crazy. That's massive. I didn't know it was that. Neither did I. Someone pointed it out to me today. My guy, Lou. Lou Betcha. Free Lou. 
But yeah, yeah. Man, that, that, that's a massive price, bro. Mm -hmm. What about round two? Plus 2,000. And that's bet online. I think he's going to finish. I don't know if it's going to be sub or TKO, but I like those prices. I think it's probably a sub, but at, at that at that price, like I feel like you got to take a shot. I don't know if I will. I've already got the one unit on the plus 100, but I think that's a pretty interesting prop as well. Yes, sir. We can move on, though. Next up, we've got the first fight of the main card. I'm extremely excited because I'm a big Peter Yan fan. We got Peter Yan versus Yadong Song. Yan is 16, 5, and 0 at this point. Uh, he's 31 years old, 5 foot 7 at the 67 inch reach. Song 21, 7, and 1. He's going to be five years younger at 26. He's going to be one inch taller, and he's going to have the same reach as Yan. I like Peter here, honestly. I feel like if he loses this fight, it's gonna be it's gonna have to be Song just really hurting him or knocking him out or just hurting him in two rounds or more. I don't see I don't I don't see Song sitting here and being able to outstrike Peter Yan just on the feet. I, I really don't. I think he's a, a, a good striker, but I don't think he's as good as Peter Yan. Even at this point in his career, you know, coming off all these losses, I don't think that has changed. I still think he's a tremendous boxer. Think still think he's real clean. His counters are still really clean. And does Song really present the issues that have really given Peter Yan these problems recently? Marab Devalishvili, incredible pressure and output and wrestling that he shot 40 times on Peter. Like, that's a lot to think about. You have to be always concerned about the takedowns. And then he was able to outstrike him too because Yan was always concerned about the takedown. Sean O'Malley, really rangy, much bigger than Song. And in my opinion, a cleaner striker. And I think his hands are faster. Song's going to have to sit there and strike with this guy in the pocket, up close. He's not going to be out here hitting him from range, hitting him from range, and moving around. He's going to have to come in. And I just think that Jan is better there. Do I think Song's going to come out here and I'll grapple Jan? No, I don't. I really don't think so. Jan has really good takedown defense. I think people are forgetting that because of the Sterling, because of the Marab fights. But again, Song Yadong is not Sterling. He's not Marab. He's just not like that. He's gotten takedowns, sure. But he's not of that caliber of a grappler. Not outside of MMA and not inside of MMA. So I feel like if Song wins this, he's knocking Peter out. Do I think that happens at a high clip? No. So I'm picking Peter here. How about you, James? Yeah, so earlier in the week, I was kind of calling the fight 50-50. And as the week goes on a little bit and I watch a little bit more tape, I kind of like PEN a little bit more than I did. Um, I think that he's a much better technical striker. And I also believe that he has grappling upside here. Um, Blunt Force said that in the chat. Mm -hmm. That's a very good look because we've seen Song have issues with the grappling before. Corey Sanhagen kind of fucked him up with the grappling a little bit. I mean, no, he didn't fuck him up. You know, he hurt him with the elbow. Um, you know, he took him down a couple of times. Song was actually doing very, very well in that fight. Uh, very well up until the stoppage. But obviously, we have to go back to the Ricky Simone fight. He got grappled bad there. Um, he didn't look good at all, you know. No, not Ricky Simone. Um, he kind of fucked up Ricky Simone. Go back to the Cody Stamen fight. And he had some issues with the grappling in that fight. You know, obviously, it seems like he's improved it. If we go to the Ricky Simone fight, he's definitely improved it there. But I do think Peter Yan's a little bit sneaky with the takedowns. I think that he's going to have so much technical upside on the feet that he's going to be able to time takedowns very well. Whereas someone like Ricky Simone, he just, you know what he's going to do. He's shooting from yeah. a mile away. He's Only very one option. Scared. Yeah, exactly. And he was very scared of the power, so he was shooting even further away than he usually does, and he usually shoots far away anyway, right? So I don't think that Peter Yan's going to be scared of the power because I think that he's going to have technical upside. He's going to be able to kind of like bob and weave a little bit, get himself under. I'm not saying he's definitely going to shoot takedowns. I'm going to say that if anyone is, it's going to be him. So for those reasons, and obviously veteran experience, fighting the highest level of competition, whereas Song's just on the border level, you know, whereas Yan's been fighting the top of the top of the top and competing with them, if not beating them. Corey Sanhagen, he won. O'Malley's the current champion. Arguably, he won. Aljo was the previous champion. He won the first fight and got disqualified and then lost the second fight split. So, yeah, I think there's a lot in the favor of Peter Yan here. Now, the, way, the reason I think that Peter Yan might lose the fight is because I don't think we might not have the same guy as we're all watching tape on. So that's something that people have to understand in this fight, right? 
Don't go back and look at his Corey Sanhagen fights and think, oh, okay, that's the fighter we're getting here. I'm not 100% sure. At this point, he's on a free fight losing streak. He's lost four out of his last five. Yes, okay, one of them was disqualification. He's won one fight in last five fights, right? That's a fact of life, okay? Yes, okay, one of them is arguable, but you know what I'm trying to say. A free fight loss streak clean. And so mentally that does something to you. I've also heard he's been, been having issues with some of his training camp. He's been moving around. Like Blunt Force said, he's been out for a while as well. Song's been competing at the top of the division and competing well and winning well. And Pete Yan, you know, he's, he's been a, a fighter for a long, long time, man. I remember his fights against Magomedov back in the day on the regionals. You know, I uh, uh, can't remember the exact organization, the Russian one. So, ACA. And, yeah, and he's been champion. He's been champion as well, um, which is a big thing, bro. Like when someone's been champion, they've already touched gold again. It was part of the reason I bet on Brandon Moreval against Brandon Moreno. Like, you've already been champion. You've done what you've come to do in the game. The motivation ain't the same. The training ain't the same. It just, it just is not. It just not. It never is, unless your name's John Jones or someone. And I guess he can do that because he don't train for a lot of those fights anyway. You know, so it's kind of he's just naturally gifted. So that's why I kind of feel like Song has a chance to win this fight because technically, for technically, I do think the PEN's got a solid upside, a sixty-five percent favorite upside or something like that. Um, but yeah, I think earlier in my breakdown, like two days ago, I called Song via split decision. I'm actually going to change my pick now and say I think Yan's going to win a decision. Um, so, yeah, man, Yan by decision for me. Yeah, I definitely see what you're saying with the mental. Like, the first thing that comes to my mind is uh, Dominic Reyes after he lost that split yeah. to John Jones. Yeah. Just never recovered. And he, he, every time he's fighting, you just hear him talking about it. And I don't really get this one, this comment over here. Where is he? SD Crusader. Why is he a head case? Am I missing something? Um, I don't, I don't know. know. I, know I know he had issues with his camp. I know that. I know he had trouble with some of the members in his camp, but uh, maybe he's talking about that, but I don't know anything outside of that. Yeah, I, I don't know, but I, I think Peter Jan should win this fight. There, there are concerns, of course. One guy is on the down, seems to be on the downtrend. Other guy seems to be up, but I just think Peter Jan, this is his fight to lose, in my opinion. Moving on, though, we've got Gilbert Burns versus Jack Della Maddalena. Burns, 22, 6, and oh, he's 37 years old, 5 foot 10 with a 71 inch reach. Jack, he's going to be 16, 2, and oh, 27 years old. He's 10 years younger, one inch taller, and he's going to have a two inch reach advantage. Why don't you start us off, James? Burns is getting knocked out, bro. Burns is getting knocked out. JDM's going to walk forward into range. And he's going to land hard, hard body shots like he always does. And Gilbert Burns, he's looking, he's looking nice these days. He's got the nice big afro. He's got the nice suit on the embedded. I think at 37 years of age, I don't think he's, I don't think he's made for this game anymore. Not against the killer like JDM. He's going to walk forward. His nose all twisted and torn. He's just going to land heavy shots, man. And I think Gilbert Burns is going to crumble. I've been targeting two fighters on this card for a long time. I've been targeting JDM and the under, and I've been targeting Benoit Saint-Denis, which I'm going to get into, and I have a few different takes on that fight um, now it's come around. I've been targeting these two for a long time since the matchup has been um, announced, and here we are. Um, of course, of course, he's going to have issues if the fight gets to the ground. I don't think it's going to get to the ground. You know, If you go back and watch the Basil Hafez fight, Yes, he got taken down multiple times, but that guy is like, how many shoot, How many takes down did he shoot? Let, let me get it up now because I don't want to misspeak, but I know that motherfucker shot a lot of motherfuckers. Got like six, down. but JDM also jumped Gilly like four times. That's the thing. That's the thing about the fight, bro. Like he wasn't really getting takedowns straight off the bat. He was mainly getting takedowns because JDM was jumping guillotine, right? So yeah, so Basel, so he, he shot 20 takedowns in that fight and he got three of them. That means JDM stuffed 17 takedowns. And the three that he did get, they were for guillotines. So, like, if he would have just stuffed them all, he probably would have got no takedowns on JDM. I do think JDM's grappling defense is improving. I don't have an Aussie bias, brother. <laughs> I, live in, I live in New Zealand, yeah, first of all. I don't live in Australia. And I just bet against the greatest fighter of all time, Alexander Volkanovsky, two weeks ago, 
on Ilya Taporia. So there ain't no uh, there ain't no bias out here, you know. I don't I don't play them games, but I also bet against my favorite Amanda Lemos, and she she won. I lost, right? But anyway, um, yeah, man, I, I think that JDM is improving in his grappling defense. I also don't think Gilbert Burns is going to shoot 20 takedowns. You know, I'm, I'm basically certain he won't. He's going to gas out bad if he does. When has Gilbert Burns ever dreamt of shooting 20 takedowns? He's never done it. He never will do it. He'll retire without ever doing it. So I don't think that this is the same matchup as the Basel Hafez fight. And I just feel like JDM's a bit niggly as well. I think even if, you know, Gilbert Burns gets him down, he might just be able to scramble at some point. I don't think, I don't think it's insta-death on the map. So, yeah, man. Um, JDM via, uh, via knockout. Brutal knockout. Real quick, appreciate your brother. Thank you for tuning in and for subscribing. If you guys are not always already subscribed, please do so and like the video. That would help a lot. Thank you all for coming here and pulling up. But yeah, so for me, I don't know, man. I, I thought I would like Jack. I thought I'd be all about him and all over his props and whatnot. But I, I don't know. I'm having a hesitation and I try to listen to my gut when it's telling me to stay away because it's normally right. I don't always trust my gut when it tells me to make a bet because sometimes I get overexcited. Yeah, that's but if there's something that. telling me, I don't know, man, be careful. I'll usually stay away. So I decided to do something a little different. I actually went fight goes to decision. I think that's, Damn. I think that's a decent spot at the current line. That's what I'm looking at. The way I see it is, do I really think Jack is going to knock out burns? Like, Who's done it? Usman? And I'm checking now. No one else in the UFC. Kamaru got him with a jab, so I get an argument. It was just a jab that knocked him out. And JDM is a nasty striker. He does mix it up really nice. He does go to the body really, really well. But I think Gilbert is going to try to shoot. I think he is going to grapple. And do I, do I think he needs 20 takedown attempts? Not really. I, I don't. I think that his jujitsu is much better than a guy like Hafez. And he gets him down once. I'm not saying he'll submit him. I don't. Obviously, I don't. If I'm pick, if I think the fight goes, but I do think he's going to get control time. I do think he's going to threaten submissions, and that's why I couldn't get the JDM because if he's taken down to the ground, I do think Burns has his opportunities, whether it's a submission or just winning moment, winning minutes. I think that's something that's here. And then why couldn't I get to Burns as an underdog if I think he's got this grappling upside? He's not a guy who comes out here shooting 20 times a. B, I think he's slowing down a little bit. I don't really know what happened in that Bilal fight. I did back Bilal, and I know there was some word of like some kind of injury he got early. Burns in that fight, I think it was his uh, left hand or his right hand. He could only use one of his hands, apparently. So I, I get it. He looked a little off, but I just think that it's, it's going to be close. I think it's going to be close. I think JDM will land the much cleaner strikes. I think Burns has a grappling upside here. I think it's relatively binary. And I just think both guys are pretty tough and durable. I don't think JDM knocks out Burns maybe, maybe later in the fight when he really gets like, I think he landed like 50 or so body shots in the, I forgot which fight it was, either the Holland or the Hafez fight. But he's usually landing a lot of body shots anyways in any fight. But I, I don't, I just don't, my, my gut's tell me I don't think so, man. And do I think Burns locks in that sub and gets that tap? It's a possibility. But again, I feel like JDM's pretty tough. He's good at fighting out of those submissions. He's been in tough spots before. This wouldn't be the first time. Hasn't been against a guy like Burns with the jujitsu of Burns. But I just think he's going to survive. So I'm leaning fight goes. And I, I don't want to bet on a side. I'm going to pick JDM. But tiny confidence. Tiny confidence. Burns is 37, bro. Yeah, but does he really look that declined other than the Bilal fight? And again, he was injured, yeah. apparently. But who's he fought? I don't think he looked great against George Masvidal, to be honest. And Masvidal's like one of the most washed fighters in UFC history at the moment. He didn't look great there. They both looked washed, in my opinion. And wasn't that the fight before the... Um... Yeah, it was. That was his fight before, before Bilal Muhammad. That was, oh, that was a month before. That's weird, eh? Neil Magny, anyone can submit him. I don't know, man. Hamzat's got no gas after round one. We've seen that in the Usman fight. I think this guy's done, bro. But we'll see. Yeah. I definitely get it. But uh, go, going with my gut here. Going with the gut. Staying away from a side. I'm going to be real happy 
if JDM, JDM ends up losing because I'm going to have dodged the bullet. But I won't be happy for my boys like you. I hope JDM does cash. I just hope it's a decision. That would be ideal. If it's I, a decision, I, bro, I'm, I'm, I'm going to bet the under, bro. Like I, I've already bet JD. I'm going to bet the under as well, bro. Isn't it chalk, though? You're going to lay no. like minus 200? Is it? I, I thought I thought it was better than that. I'll probably just play JDM ITD. Fight ends is minus 170, minus 195, under two and a half. I'm only seeing it up in one place, but it's minus 148. Okay. Yeah. That's not bad, to be honest, because I, I think Burns' path is a submission here. I don't think Burns can win a decision. I honestly don't. Unless he grapples him like he did Wonderboy, but I just feel like the dynamics of the fight, I don't think he can ground him for three rounds. I think I just don't think it's going to happen. I don't really see him winning the decision, so I kind of like the under here. Fair enough. Fair enough. First real disagreement of the card. It's got to happen at some point, right? Yeah, exactly. <clears throat> but all right, we can move on. Next up, we've got... This fight's got a lot of people split. We got Kevin Holland versus Michael Venom Page coming in from Bellator. Holland 25, 10, and 0. He's 31 years old, six foot three with an 81 inch reach. Page 21, 2 and 0. He's going to be 36. He's five years older, same height, and he's at a two inch reach disadvantage. I'll start us off here. So I'm on Holland in terms of a pick, but this does kind of give me shades of like Michael Chandler, Dan Hooker when Chandler made his UFC debut. Also on the older side of things, I don't know about you. I personally gave him very little chance against Hooker. Thought that was going to be Hooker all day and came out and knocked him out. So kind of getting that vibe here, but I just don't think so. I, I don't think Paige is going to win the fight. I see a lot of people talking about, oh, can't trust Holland. Can't trust his IQ. Can't trust him to grapple. I don't need him to grapple here. I don't think he needs it. <clears throat> I really don't. If he wants to make life easy, I think he should grapple. Page, his takedown defense has improved a lot. I thought it looked pretty good against Logan Storley, but he is getting taken down. He's getting taken down against Lima. Lima's a great fighter, but he's kind of faded by the time they were fighting. And I just, I don't think Holland needs it. I think on the feet, Holland is also a really good striker. He's real fast. He's got really good counters. He's got a lot of power. He's going to have the reach advantage here. And for, for Holland, he's already fought someone like Page. He's fought Steven Thompson. He's seen almost the exact same style in my opinion, on a better fighter. Whereas Paige, has he fought anyone like Holland? No. Hasn't fought a guy of this uh, with this kind of range. He hasn't fought a guy this tall. He hasn't fought a guy with this much power. By, by this tall, I mean like who's actually good, not the bums they were feeding him in Bellator early before he got to Lima, before he got to Storley. He just hasn't fought a guy like Kevin Holland. And I don't like the way his hands are down. I get it. It's a style. Looks cool. Don't think it's a good move against a guy like Holland. He's gotten caught before against Lima. I don't see why Holland can't catch him. And I, I honestly think Holland's going to knock him out. I really do. And if he doesn't, I think he can win the decision on the feet. I don't think he needs those takedowns. Holland's got a much better output than someone like Page. I don't think that the damage is going to add up on him like it did with Steven Thompson. I don't think Page hits as hard. So I think Holland should win this fight. It's his fight to lose. Of course, he can pull a stunt. But I don't even know what the stunt would have to look like here. He would have to like not throw anything because I'm not concerned about him not grappling. I don't think he needs to do it. I think he should do it, but I'm not sweating it thinking, oh, is he going to grapple? Is he not? I don't know. I don't think he has to. But how about you, James? I think Paige is much better striker than Holland, to be honest, bro. Really? Yeah. But I do. Yeah, I do. I, I think he's way better. But the thing is, this is MMA, and I think that when the going gets tough, when Holland clinches him up against the cage, if he lands a couple of elbows, I think that the, dynam that the dynamics on the feet could change. But if it, if it was like a kickboxing match, I think Paige just... I think it's black belt versus white belt, like kickboxing match. I honestly do, man. I don't want to say white belt. Obviously, Holland's a good striker. I'll give him a blue belt, you know? Maybe he just, just got upgraded to purple recently or something. But Paige is a black belt in, in, in that regard. But this is MMA, so I'm not saying it's impossible for him to land something with the overall dynamic of the wrestling and, and the range and the clinching and the stuff like that. But I, I really do think Michael Page is a much better striker for him uh, than him. And I do think early he's going to kind of clown him. I think he'll be able to land shots early. I think Kevin Holland will be landing leg kicks. But outside of leg kicks, I don't think Kevin Holland will be landing much in round one. I think it could be a dominant round one from Michael Page. I think he can... 
I don't think it'll do much damage because Holland is also good at like not taking a lot of damage. You know, he doesn't turns take well. Damage. Yeah, he turns very well. He's a very good striker in his own right, but I just think the puzzle that you have to get past is at least going to take well, one round, right? I don't think Holland's going to do much in round one unless he gets a takedown. So, you know, I do think that round one's going to be Michael Venn and Page's round. I am different than you, and I think Holland does need to wrestle here. And that's where I get a bit worried for Page because I think that Page isn't that str- I don't think he's very strong. I think that te- technically he's not a bad defensive wrestler. I think he's quite good, but I think he's quite weak. I think he can be taken down with strength. And I think Holland, if he gets gripped around his waist, I think he can drag him to the ground. I think he can slam him to the ground. And I think that's where we can see some damage from Kevin Holland because Kevin Holland has very underrated jiu-jitsu. Um, I think Michael Venom Page is okay at staying safe, but I think that Holland kind of will rinse him on the ground, to be honest, or at, at least maintain control fairly easily and win the round. If the fight gets to the ground, I don't really see Michael getting back to his feet that often. You know, I think that a good amount of the clock will be burnt there. So this is a massive, massive pass fight for me overall, man. I think both fighters have upside in different areas of the fight. And the thing which VB said, which is very true, MVP is 36, man. And I think, I mean, he's, at, he's almost 37. I think, Couch, I think two weeks from today, he's 37 or something like that. He's 37 very soon. I know that for a fact. So I think that... In 28 be, days. 28 days, he's 37, right? So it's, it's less than a month by the time the fight comes around. It's less than a month now. So I think that can play massively into this fight. Also, this is his UFC debut. We have to take that into account. UFC debuts... People don't do well, right? Even if they've got experience in other organizations. I tend to think that Michael Venom Page is the type of fighter that the jitters won't get to him. I know him very well. I remember him from back in the day. He's a London fighter. He's from London like myself, so I'm familiar with him. And I don't think he's the type of fighter to perform underwhelmingly on his debut. I feel like he's going to look the exact same as we've always seen him. But he's older now, so that's going to be the issue there. I don't think the the jitters are going to get to him, but... We have to cap it in a little bit. But I do think that his age might get to him. We haven't really seen him put on a, a long performance in a long time. I mean, I'll go to his record right now. I mean, that Yamuchi fight, I bet on him there at like Pickham. And that was just the, the one of the crazy. luckiest bets ever. I mean, he just kicks him and his knee just indents. I've never seen anything like Instantly. it. It was like one kick, right? Yeah, one leg kick and his knee just indented. So, you know, the knee's usually facing out. So he gets hit with a leg kick and a knee faced in. It's like one of the weirdest things I've ever seen. But Michael Page does that weird shit, man. You remember when he did the exact same thing to my man's forehead, um, Cyborg. So your forehead's meant to poke out a little bit. And then his forehead started poking in. He caved his forehead in. So Michael Venom Page, he's got some bone density on him or something because... He can land some crazy shit. And I wouldn't be surprised to see him land a flying knee KO brutally in this fight or something like that. Because it's always live, right? But you have to go back to 2021. Or at least, tw- all right, you have to go back to 2022. Which is a long time ago now. You're talking two years ago, you know. Um, and it was May as well. So basically two years ago, to see him put on a, a long performance. That was against Logan Storley, who's a, a wrestler. So I don't know, man. Like, there's a lot of weird things in this fight. It's a long breakdown because I felt like there was a lot to be said. But it's funny because it's my longest breakdown that I've done on this podcast. Is is it's the fight that I'm passing the most on. Like I'm more <laughs> closer. I'm more closer to betting Oleg Zaychek on the Oleg Zaychek fight than I am this fight. And I said that was a fat pass as well. But that's often how it happens because a lot of times when there's so many different moving parts, those are the fights that you pass on because it's hard to predict because there's just so many moving parts. So that's why I'm passing on it, man. I just feel like there's outs for both fighters, but. Good luck to to you. Did you you bet uh, Kevin Holland? Not yet. Okay, so if you do, good luck to you, man. If not, good luck to my fellow London Londoner. I'm gonna pick Michael Page for the debut win as an underdog. I feel like I just picked the underdog in this spot, to be honest. Fair enough. Fair enough. But we can move on to the co-main event. Probably one of the best fights, if not the best fight on the card. I think it might be. We got Dustin Poirier versus Benoit Saint Denis. Poirier, twenty nine, eight and zero. 35 years old. He's five foot nine with a 73 inch reach. Santini, he's 13, one and oh, 28. He's going to be seven years younger, three inches taller. No, two inches taller. And he's going to have the same reach. Why don't you start us off, James? 
Yeah, this is a great fight, man. I told you that for a long time I've been looking at two fighters to target on this card. It's JDM and BSD. I feel like there's a change in a passing of the torch going on in MMA recently. We've seen Ilya Taporia take over. I feel like this weekend we'll probably see JDM and BSD take over and get their limelight. We've seen O'Malley knock out Aljo not too long ago. You know, there's been a few of these type of fights. Um, and so I think that this fight is BSD's fight to lose. I think the grappling upside is too hard to ignore. But he's very open on the feet. And I don't just want to give the same breakdown as a lot of the market is going to be given this week because obviously everyone thinks BSD is going to win. The market smashed him. He's like minus 225. Mm -hmm. I didn't think he'll be that price, to be honest. I thought I'd be able to. The reason I said I've been targeting this fight, I don't target fights only because I think this fight is definitely going to win because that fight might be minus 400, then I don't really care about it, right? But I target fights that I believe the lines are going to be playable and that I think they're going to win. So I thought that I'd get a pick em on BSD here and I'd be able to play him. And obviously- He as the underdog on uh, yeah. DraftKings. Yeah, yeah. So it was a pick em for a while. It was like minus 110, minus 120. And then over the last 10 days or so, it started to pick up. I remember it, met, it went minus 150 about seven to 10 days ago. And I was like, all right, Maybe I'll make my move now. And then I didn't make my move. And then I woke up and it was like literally minus 200. And I was like, oh, shit, man. And then I didn't make my move. I was like, well, I ain't playing minus 200 because surely Poye, Poye money comes back in. And then I woke up a few, few days later and it was minus 230. And I'm like, Jesus Christ. And I have seen that there's been some buyback now. You know, he's gone back down to minus 210 on Bet Online. I think he was minus 225 there at one point. So there has been some buyback on Dustin Poye. Um, it's a good fight, man. Dustin Poirier is a fucking dog. He's a dog. And if you don't get Dustin Poirier out of there, he's going to match the dogness of Benoit Saint-Denis. I'll tell you that now. Like, Dustin Poirier ain't going to give up on himself, right? Unless he's just done with the game, right? He got knocked out against Justin Gaethje brutally. I don't really know what his aspirations are. He's been at the top of the top for a long, long time. I remember he was waiting out for a Conor McGregor trilogy for a long, long time. And then he finally for Justin Gaethje. So I don't know where his head's at at this point in time. He's got his Louisiana hot sauce. Like a lot of things are going on with Dustin Poirier. Benoit Saint-Denis is coming to kill and he's coming to get the belt, man. So like mentally, he's not there at all, right? Like they're different trajectories mentally. But it doesn't always play out like that. That's the person who's going to win in the fight. So Poirier is a fucking dog, man. If we get the Poirier of any fight I've ever seen of him, then I think this is going to be a good fight unless BSD just slices for him on the ground, which is possible. But if BSD don't get him out of there, round three, four, it's going to be tough. Like, Poirier is going to be landing shots. BSD striking defense is terrible on the feet. The guy gets hit ev by everybody clean. Gabriel Miranda was pinging his head back like a slot machine. That thing was going bang, bang, bang. And Gabriel Miranda, he's very aggressive. He can't do that, but he ain't a great fighter. Tiago Moises, he was more of a kicker. He will not really doing it. He kind of just run through Tiago Moises there. I had a play on him at minus 130. I like BSD a lot. I also had a play on him against Bomfim, plus 250. I also had a max bet on Zaleski Dos Santos against him, minus 200. So I feel like I know the guy quite well. I bet on Frivola as well, but I don't, I don't hate that bet. I'd probably make it again if they fought a plus 200. It was a random so head kick. I, I did it last yeah. time and I'd do it again too. It, it was a random head kick. It is what it is. You know, he probably wins the fight. I don't think he deserved to be uh, plus, uh, minus 250. It is what it is though. Um, the grappling hole is massive in this fight. Like, it's it's humongous. I've seen time and time again, Dustin Poirier just gets worked on the ground. It, honestly, it's it's. I don't understand how he's, like, championship caliber seeing what I've seen of him on the ground. Michael Chandler was dominating. Every time Michael Chandler shot a takedown, he got it. Every single time. I don't care what UFC stats said. I watched that fight a few days ago. Poirier did not stop a takedown. Does it say he stopped the takedown? Because he didn't not stop that. You made me want to go check. <laughs> he did he not stopped, stop the takedown in that fight. He allegedly stopped four of them. Three yeah, of seven. Fuck all of that, man. Like, let me tell you something now. I don't, maybe there was half takedowns. You know, they just, if he di dips down for the leg, they just call it a, a takedown attempt or some bullshit. But let me tell you, man, when Michael Chandler got his hands on him and took the fight to the ground, he did it with ease. And I'm not going to say that Michael Chandler is like, I don't think he's worlds apart from BSD. I think he's way more athletic and I think he's way more explosive. But I still think that BSD is going to be able to take him down with ease. And Michael Chandler sliced through his guard easily. Um, Oliveira tapped him out easily, took his back easily. 
he gives his backup every all the time. He gives his backup all the fucking time. Um, BSD takes the back very well. We've seen time and time again now in multiple fights that he takes the back very well. And I just, I can't get BSD taking him down and just pounding him out, man. I can't get that out of my head. I really can't. But like I said, man, Dustin on the feet, the boxing is, the grappling hole is as big as the striking hole is. But the issue is BSD has very, very good durability. Whereas I don't think Dustin has great durability on the ground. Like I think he's just going to get sliced through and he could get submitted type thing. And obviously durability doesn't come into play when you're getting choked unconscious. Do you know what I mean? So I'm going to pick BSD for the for the win. I definitely think he's going to win. I, I think this is a passing of the torch. Um, I think he probably finishes the fight as well. But Poya is tough as fuck, man. I was seeing the fight goes to decision is like, Plus 500, plus 600 crazy, in some crazy. spots, yeah, which is, I don't really agree with that. Because it's, it's five Poirier, rounds. Because it's five rounds, but Poirier is so fucking tough. And BSD, he's not like super slick submission guy like um, like Oliveira. And he doesn't have the, 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 the strength and the pressure in the grappling that Khabib does. Nowhere near. Khabib like latches onto you. There's still some space between BSD's grappling, right? So he's still a bit wild. You can still throw him off a little bit. You can't do that with Khabib. So, you know, Khabib's more of a snake. BSD's like he's just a bit of a marauder. He's going to keep taking you down and stuff. So, yeah, I don't I don't know what I'm going to do with this fight. I, I feel like I've got a very strong read on it. So I want to, like, capitalize on that read and play something. But it all depends on what the lines give me. I don't, I don't think I'm brave enough to play a plus 500 GTD. But maybe I am if I sprinkle it in with a... Benoit Saint Denis three or four play or something like that. Do you know what I mean? So, yeah, man, that's my overall prediction. I think Benoit Saint Denis is going to win the fight. Yeah, yeah, makes sense for me. This has been tough, man. There's two things, two lines that I'm interested in right now. Dustin money line. You know, I'll talk about why I'm very hesitant there. And Saint Denis KO because I'm pretty surprised that it's plus three thirty five on Bet Online plus three thirty. That's a pretty wide line. I. I get that he can take Dustin's back. I, I totally get it. I did want to address this real quick. He didn't try to get up because he fully knew that if he tried to get, get up, Oliveira was going to take his back. That's why he had him wrapped up and, and didn't even bother because he he knew that, that it was clipped. So, I, I mean, if anything, that's good for me. Good fight, IQ. Good. But in terms of the fight here, I don't really think Santini – submits him. I don't know why. I just really don't think so. I think Poirier's jujitsu is very solid. I think his defensive jujitsu is very solid. Oliveira is a different level. I mean, the I wouldn't compare him and BSD on the ground personally. I think Oliveira has got way better jujitsu. And I just hey, think Chandler that if, almost had him. Chandler, huh? almost had, Chandler almost had him and Chandler can't submit anyone. Fair enough. But Ch Chandler is also much stronger. Maybe not much stronger, actually. Explosive and athletic, yeah. Yeah, but I just think a KO is more likely, and you're getting plus 335 on it. That's a pretty tempting line for me, because for me, Poirier, I don't know where the chin's at. I don't want to say he has a bad chin just because Gaethje knocked him out. Gaethje hits like a train, but Chandler did also hurt him, so it's possible that Santini can hurt him. I think it is very possible that Santini can knock him out, because another thing I've noticed with Poirier is he doesn't really handle that kind of insane, just nonstop pressure that Santini brings early, right? When Santini starts the fight, he just goes, just off. And when Chandler was doing that to him, Poirier was really struggling. He was really having a hard time when Chandler was pressuring and going for those, going for the strikes, hurting him. It just didn't look great. Another issue I have with Poirier, why I'm pretty hesitant, even though I think the, like to play his money line, even though I think this line is pretty crazy in a five-rounder, for BSD's biggest step up yet, Poirier seems to kind of, I feel like he's got slower. I, I feel like his hands got slower. He's not as fast as he used to be. So I'm a little nervous there. So there's a few red flags that are kind of keeping me off the money line for now. But at the same time, BSD's so fucking hittable. On the feet, what does he have? We were talking about Almeida having two strikes. He has what, yeah. three? He got the yeah. body kick that will bring up to the head. Yeah. And he's got a few punches, and that's really it. He's not some insane striker. He's got a lot of power, and he's relentless, and I think he can get a ground and pound. That's why I think the KO is interesting at plus 300. But do I think he's a better striker than Poirier? No. Do I even think it's close on the feet? Not really. Maybe there's an equalizer here with the pressure power, but in terms of just pure striking, I don't even think it's close. 
Poirier is one of the best boxers in the UFC, in my opinion. And I think that if this fight does extend, I do think Poirier is going to take over. Santini, in my opinion, I don't think he's going to look great in round three. Don't think he's going to look great in round four. We've seen him slow down even in round twos. And he's going to come out here like he does every time and give it his all in the first round. And if Poirier can just survive, I'm going to feel a lot better about it. That's why maybe this is just a spot where I stay away and I watch the live line. I watch BSD beat the crap out of Poirier in the first round. And then if he doesn't get a finish, Poirier is going to be like plus 300 or higher. And then I take my shot. Maybe that's something I do here. We'll see. I also think I might get a better line on Poirier later in the week because I've been talking about it. I think the parlays are going to come in heavy. I think people are going to continue to play BSD. I think they're going to continue to parlay him. And I just think that if the fight extends, I really do think Poirier wins. Even line aside, throw the line aside just in terms of who I think wins if the fight keeps going past the third round or into the third round. I think it's Poirier. I like his striking a lot more. Maybe he's getting taken down, but I think he'll be able to get back up. Watch the back. Keep your back to the fence. And I really do think that he can win this fight. Can he knock out Santini? I doubt it. But I also have never seen Santini in the fourth or fifth round. So I can't really say it with confidence that, you know, I'm going to play Poirier by decision at plus 900 or whatever VB said it was, which is very interesting to me, plus 900, because you don't have to get involved too heavy. And I think if we go to a decision, it's very likely Poirier wins. Something that just came into my brain that I actually kind of want to check is I want to know what Poirier decision only is, if it's out yet. And DraftKings normally has it. So let me just try to pull it up real quick, because that I like. I do kind of like that. I'm not saying Santini uh, can't win a decision. I don't like but... that, to be honest, bro. No? Nah? Why not? Grappling hole, grappling hole is too big. Like he he could have been he could have been going so in the Chandler out, fight yeah. he could have been two nil down going into the third round. Now the only reason he wasn't is because he almost knocked him out in the the end of round one. So it was one one going into the third, but that was like kind of like a random knockdown because Chandler got way too wild. That could have easily been two nil going into round three with a known known gasser. Saint Denis is not a known gasser. Who do you think has a better better gas tank? Chandler or Saint Denis? I mean, I do you really think Saint Denis has that good of a gas tank? Chandler's got no gas tank. Guys, gas is out almost every fight. He's also fighting in insane fights with a tremendous volume. Pretty much all of them. So it's Saint Denis. Yeah, but that's like in the first round and second well, round. You, you and you that's when Chandler it's had, you think Chandler has a better gas tank than Benoit Saint Denis? I'm not comfortable saying it either way. I, I I don't think it's close to because I didn't I tape think, Chandler for this. I don't think it. I don't think it's close. So, you know, he he was too. He could have been two nil up going into round three against Dustin Poirier, and he got choked out because he's gasser, right? And and yeah, he was tired in round three, and he went for some weird throw, and he just got his back taken and choked out because he's a gas bag. So that could have been like you know, if that's two nil already, he's lost the first two rounds against someone who gasses out. So I could easily see. Bro, Benoit Saint Denis could easily get takedowns even when he's gassed it. Po Poirier has terrible, terrible grappling, man. So I don't like it personally. But it's fair. It's fair. I mean, we'll see what the line is. I just personally think if you're telling me what because decision only means it's only live if we go to the decision. Yeah. In a five rounder, Santini's first ever five rounder. If I'm getting something like plus two hundred, plus whatever it is on Poirier, which is probably unlikely considering his money line, but we'll see. If it's something like that, I I'm going to probably have to make that play. We'll see again, but tempted on Poirier money line as well. I just think if the red flags that I'm seeing, if he's not really, if his chin isn't gone, if he's not as slow as I'm thinking he might be at this point, I feel like he's very live to win this fight, but we'll see. I might end up just watching as a fan. Like I said, maybe I'll live bet it. If it's something insane after the first round, because I think I think Santini wins the first round at a really high clip. Personally, like I mentioned before, I don't think Poirier handles that kind of an onslaught early very well. So I don't think he's going to win the first round at a high clip. So we'll see what happens, but we can move on at this point. I think it's going to be a really good fight that I can say very confidently. Now watch we get like a Derek Lewis Francis Naganu staring match. Impossible. It, it, impossible. Impossible. Bro. Impossible. impossible. There's no way. There's no way. Nah.
Ben I Wall's staying in the octagon. My best case scenario in this fight, I don't bet it. Santini wins. The hype boys do their job. He gets his title shot, and we get a good line against Islam on Islam. That would be my best case scenario because I, I would go ham. I would bet Islam so hard against Santini. It, I don't think that's even a close fight, personally. Mm. James is already thinking. Maybe a fight he's going to tape tomorrow. Yeah, I don't know. It's an interesting one. I, 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 yeah, I want to think about it. I want to think about it. I don't want to just instantly agree. I want to think about it a little bit. Fair enough. Fair enough. But we can move on to our main event. We've got Sean O'Malley versus Marlon Vera 2. We got O'Malley 17-1 and oh, he's 29 years old. 5'11 with a 72-inch reach. Vera 23-8 and 1. He's going to be two years older. He's going to be three inches shorter. And he's going to be at a two-inch reach disadvantage. I'll start us off here. I don't know. I think the line's a little wide, personally. Because for me... I'm not expecting any grappling from either guy. I think it's highly unlikely. And if they shoot, I don't think they're getting the takedowns. So then you're telling me we're probably getting a 25-minute striking match or however long it lasts, right? Do I think Vera should be 30% on the feet against O'Malley on a striking fight? No, I, I don't think so. I personally don't. I think he's going to have the power edge. He, sure, he starts slow. I've heard that plenty. But it's not like he's never won a first round before. He started much faster against Munoz. He took that first round. I really like the way he backs people up. I like his forward pressure. O'Malley's a guy who moves laterally a lot. But if you can back him up, you can have a lot more success. Even Peter Jan was doing it. And Peter's very, very small compared to O'Malley. Vera, not so much. I think he can back him up. Use those leg kicks. I'm not going to come out here and say he's going to replicate the first fight and knock his legs off. No, I don't think so. But I think he's going to use those leg kicks. I think he's going to slow him down, take away his range, get up close, use your elbows, use your nasty knees. I love that stuff from him. And I think this is a really close fight. If that, if if, if I'm correct, I, I think it's going to be close. I don't think O'Malley will look minus 280. And I think there's a ton of value on the money line for Vera. I'm not playing it, at least not yet. But I, I do think there's a ton of value there. I think there's value on the decision no action on Vera. Not on Bet Online, though. Bet Online's minus 165. I don't like that. But on other books, he is at plus money. I think that's a pretty good spot. I think if someone's getting a finish, I'm not going to say O'Malley can't, but I think it's Vera who's more likely to get the finish and O'Malley who's more likely to win that decision. And if you bet finish only, if it goes to decision, get your money back. Don't have to sweat it. At the same time, though, I think Vera could possibly win a decision as well. It could look something like the font fight where he's getting outstruck in terms of output. But when it comes to damage, he's landing the damage. He's cutting him up. He's bruising him up. O'Malley's bleeding. That's kind of how I'm seeing it. So I think O'Malley probably wins, but I think the value is on Vera personally at this line if the fight goes how I think it goes and it remains on the feet. How about you, James? Yeah, I feel like O'Malley's path is a decision victory here. And in that type of fight, you have to give Vera some credence at a big underdog price. So on my breakdown, I did two or three days ago on YouTube, I picked Marlon Vera to win outright. And I'm not super confident in him to win. I think I just didn't want to be a pussy and say, yo, like, you know, there's value on him, but, you know, I don't think he's going to win. And you just cover both bases, you know. I don't know, man. I just... Thanks, <laughs> thanks, James. Oh, is that what you... <laughs> Sorry, bro. I'm, I'm zoning out at this point. I, I, the thing is, if someone put a gun to my head, and said, if you get this wrong, I'm going to kill you. Who would I choose? <laughs> I, I probably would choose O'Malley. It's just a safer pick. I feel like he can dance on the outside. So I guess I am saying that. But fuck it, man. Marlon Vera is going to win this weekend. He's going to win the Bantamweight title. I think the title is going to change hands again. O'Malley is going to look beautiful in this fight at times. I, I think his striking is super elite. You know, a lot of people liked uh, was fading him. Because they thought, you know, he was a fraud or something. It's funny. When we get these fighters who are hyped up, a lot of the market likes to fade them. But that's when you can get some good prices on them. You know, I've bet on O'Malley plus 250 against Aljamain Sterling. Um, he was like minus 200 or better against like Pat Piver and fighters like that. So 
I feel like O'Malley is one of these fighters where a lot of people tried to fade him and he's won a lot of money. And now it's it's flipped pans, right? Now it's completely the other way. Now he's now I don't think that many people are trying to fade him. You know, maybe they are, but I don't know. He was minus 200 a couple of days ago and now he's minus 300. So I don't think they are trying to fade him. Um, I think that Sean O'Malley will have chances to land big shots on Marlon Vera here. He's the much better striker. It's not close. But Marlon Vera has much more durability. It's not close. He has the pace and pressure. He has the experience in the five-round fights that O'Malley doesn't have. O'Malley has now won the belt. He's already tasted that win. There's, always, there's also a mental thing that always comes into rematches. So I don't know how that's going to affect it. But I like it. I like it because there's more volatility in the fight. And so if I'm betting a plus 250, I just like extra volatility. I don't know if the volatility is going to go my way, but I do know that it's extra vol it's more volatile based on that rematch, right? So I do think that that's a positive for me if I'm betting Vera. And I can't see a round four or five that's not close. I can't really see a dominant round five for O'Malley. I mean, maybe if he's bust him up so much, oh, Vera's, Vera's kind of out of ideas at that point. It could happen. But personally, when I see the fight in round four or round five, I feel like Vera's landing just as much as O'Malley. I feel like the uh, the volume is about even at that point. Well, Malley's like never been there either, four or exactly. five. Exactly. Exactly. So, like, that's why I think it's going to be very close in them rounds, if not give a little bit of an edge to uh, Marlon Vera. So, yeah, man, there's a few reasons why I like Marlon Vera here. I also feel like O'Malley could be tentative. You know, he's very tentative against Pedro Munoz and actually lost him round one. So everyone thinks that, you know, Marlon has to come in in round, uh, round four and round five and come back and win the fight. He might lose. O'Malley might lose round one, just like he did against Pedro Munoz. He lost round one on two judges' scorecards. So, you know, I don't think it's a, a guarantee that Marlon has no success in round one. Pedro had success. He won the round. And last time they fought, he got a knockout. Also, when he got on top in that fight, he elbowed the fuck out of his head badly. Okay, I think about 50% of that was down to O'Malley being a bit delirious, kind of worried about the leg, wondering how the fuck is he on top of me? My leg's hurt and this is weird. Like, I do think about 50% of that elbow was because of that. But I also think the other 50% is because Marlon's probably quite strong on top. He's quite strong as well. And I don't think O'Malley's the best. I think O'Malley's got slick jiu-jitsu. But I don't think he's strong. I think he's quite weak. And I think that if you get on top of him, you probably can do damage. We haven't really seen it in the UFC. The only time we've seen it was when he got knocked out by Marlon Vera, man. So, you know, he, he almost got his lights turned off in that fight, bro. You know, regardless of the leg. Obviously, the leg led up to it. But the ground and pound wasn't fully to do with the leg. So, I don't know, man. There's a few reasons why I like Marlon Vera in this spot. And I'm picking Marlon Vera as a massive underdog. One of the biggest underdogs on the entire card. Might be, all right, not the biggest, but he's, he's close. So, yeah, man, uh, I like Marlon Vera in this spot. All right. We, we, we mostly agree. We mostly agree. I'm just, as you said, I'm a little too wuss to pick Vera outright, but more than likely my money is going to be on Vera in some shape or form. We'll just see how it is. But, yeah, that's a card, guys. That's UFC 299. I am really looking forward to this card. We've got 62 of you hanging out with us live right now. I believe that's a Couch Warrior podcast record. So nice. that's dope. Thank you all for tuning in. Thank you, James, for pulling up. James, uh, why don't you uh, plug your stuff real quick? I'll plug myself, and then we'll get out of here. Yeah, thanks for having me on, Mike. Always a good um, time. And this is a great card to do it, man. So like you said, we agree mostly. The only thing we really went against each other on JDM was... JDM Burns. JDM Burns. And then I guess the, the Poye fight, we kind of disagreed a little bit specifically about that one decision only prop. But I'll be interested to see if it gets there. I would just say, man, don't burn yourself on the decision only. Because if it goes to decision, you're going to be fuming. So maybe put a little bit on the decision, man. But yeah, we'll see what happens with the Burns fight. That's a complete opposite pick. You're picking the fight goes to decision. If you cash that, I'm going to have to give you a uh, a shout out or something because I really, really don't think that, right. bro, I really don't think that fight goes to decision because um, just the dynamic of the fight. So if you call that, yeah, man, that's going to be a big one for you. But yeah, bro, just thanks for having me on. Uh, anybody can find me by going to any social media and just typing at lucrative MMA. One thing I will shout out actually, Mike, I don't know if you've seen, but 
I'm doing a giveaway for UFC 300. I did see. So, yeah, so I'm giving someone two free tickets to UFC 300. So if you want to sign up for that giveaway, it's completely free to enter. All you need to do is like my Instagram post and comment on it. Very easy. So just go to my Instagram, at MMA. You see the pin post there. So I guess that's the only real thing I want to shout out, man. Um, thanks for having me on, bro. Oh, yeah. And then for me, guys, so obviously went live today. Um, tomorrow, hopefully, should be interviewing Jared Gooden. That won't be live, but I will put it up tomorrow night if it happens. <laughs> it's tough scheduling fighters. I was telling James this earlier. Fighters aren't really good at time zones, huh. like at all. <laughs> so we'll see if it really happens. I hope so. I, I'm a big Jared Gooden fan. I've been backing him for a minute, so that'll be cool. Hoping it happens. And then on Thursday, we're doing the panel, pay-per-view panel, me and my guy, 138 MMA. It's going to be uh, at 9.15 Eastern time. Should be a good time. We're going to have two dope guests on, so make sure to check that out. And I am officially on a paid Discord. My picks are no longer free. I did give out a few of them on during the show, so if you missed them, run it back. I'll have timestamps up and everything probably by tomorrow. But I am on Beer Money Discord. All the links are in my link tree. It's in my YouTube description. It's in my Twitter. It's, I believe, it's 40 bucks a month. I can get you a 25% disc discount code, Couch Warrior Pod. I'll give it to you right now. And you're not just getting my MMA picks. You're getting all other sports, basketball, football, stuff I don't know anything about. And these guys are pretty damn good. So make sure to check that out. And th that is the only place for my official bets at this point. So, yeah, check that out. And thank you guys all once again. And peace out and good luck.